Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Empower Ed session today, where we're going to endeavour to bring you all of the information you need about products and services. And in this Empower Ed session, we'll explore the incredible features and benefits of I Am Compliant. My name is Lucy, and I'm from Head Teach Chat, and I'm thrilled to be your host today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Andy, the school's mentor and co-founder of I Am Compliant. And apparently he's a school superhero on a mission to vanquish compliance challenges and ensure that every school is a safe haven from learning and teaching. With extensive experience in the education sector facilities management, Andy is your go-to source for all things compliance and estates management. And we're also joined by Luke, who is the founder and CEO. And Luke is passionate about the value that it's bringing to the education sector, both in terms of statutory compliance and estates management, and is a passionate advocate of continual professional development as a key to unlock sustainability in schools. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so um, before we dive in, Let's have a quick look at what we're going to cover in this 30-minute uh, session. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at an introduction into iron compliance. And then we're going to be looking at finding solutions to common problems. Uh, then we'll be doing a live product demonstration, which will be a really good time for you to have a look at iron compliance and what they can offer. And at the end, there's a Q&A session. But if you have any questions as we go along, we do have a chat box. Feel free to put them in there and we'll do our best to ask, ask them as we go along. So let's get started. Shall we find out a little bit about I Am Compliant? And is that going to be Luke that does that? Andy's leading the way on this one, I think. Andy. Hello, Andy. Thank you very much, Lucy. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Not yet. Yes, we can. There you go. There I, I'm down in Somerset, so there's a slight delay in, in <laughs> how down here. So, oh. Thank you. Very much. I think what would be useful is to look at the life of a head teacher now compared to the life of a head teacher ten years ago. Because if you were around ten years ago, things are completely different. So you used to be the head teacher. Now you're the head of everything everything involved in the school you're you're deeply involved in and and we look at this and it's not just the head teacher to be honest it's the school business manager and it's the caretaker so when luke and i first got together and, and formed i am it was at that point where schools were moving away from the local authority and becoming academies in their own right and of course as soon as that happened you'd lost all that support from the local authority and through no fault of anyone's, what we found in the schools in particular, because we were working with schools and in schools at the time, was that you had the head teacher, the school business manager and the site manager didn't really understand anything about compliance or the regulations associated with the estates. And nor should they, because that's not what you went to university to find out about. So the role has changed significantly on all aspects. And there's a lot of worry that comes with this new change in role. And one of those, and we'll go through them step by step, but one of those is the compliance. And these are the main questions, basically, that we get asked regarding compliance. Like, what should I be doing? And when should I be doing it? And how do you know what you've got to do in the first instance? So unless you're a bit sad like me and spend all your time reading regulations and government documents and things like that, you probably won't know. A lot of that will just be coming from your peer groups. You might be relying on them telling you this is what we do in the school. But generally, you're out, you're out in the middle of the desert without any water. So those leading questions of what to do, when to do, who can do it, more particularly, and how to do it, are really important. And again, we can provide a solution for that. So it's a one-stop shop. You don't have to go and read all the different regulations regarding it. Obviously, you're interested in making sure that you've got evidence to support all these tasks that you've been completing. The other thing, of course, is the estates management, something that you probably wouldn't even think about 10 years ago. Now, it's a massive thing. Department for Education are very heavy on estates management at the moment. You're now in the world of conditional surveys, asset registers, not just your basic asset. Everyone thinks on asset registers that it's all the IT equipment. It's, it's far more detailed than that. 
And also you've got to think about the money that you're spending as well. And part of that outside of your budgets will be when you need to replace things. And a really good story, really, to be honest, is when people get all excited because you've had a refurb in the school, you've got a brand new building built or a complete refurbishment of an old building, and you've got brand new spanking fire extinguishers all over the place. So you've got 20 brand new extinguishers. Nobody's told you that in five years' time you're going to have to replace all those extinguishers. And at £75 a pop, that's a couple of grand that you're going to have to find in your budget for five years' time. So it's little things like that. It's just knowing what's coming around the corner ahead of you. You're also now heavily involved, thanks particularly to last year, into utilities management as well. Back in the day, we tell people to switch lights off and we're thinking more from the eco side of things and trying to be a green school. Now it's kind of driven home to us a little bit more because it's costing so much money for us. And now we've entered the world of daylight harvesting, for example, and automatic sensors that switch lights on and off when people are or aren't in a particular area. So that has changed just over in the last year. That just shows you how quickly it's all adapted. And then there's the maintenance. And the Department for Education reckon around about 45% of schools are on, on the way down because of the maintenance. It's a heavy expense on you, on your budget. It's something that if you keep on top of, then it's going to be more cost effective for you. I've worked in loads of schools over the years, in the past 17 years. I've never, ever, ever, ever replaced a working boiler in the school. I had, In my last school, I had a boiler that was 40 years old. It kept chugging away. But because it kept chugging away, we didn't replace it. You wait until the boiler breaks and then you replace it. By that time, you've lost so much money anyway, because the boiler now is based on efficiency, not the fact that it works or not. Moving away from states, one of your big bugbears is policies and documents. And certainly in all my dealings with the current schools that use I am, this is a biggie for them. It's very time consuming. How do you manage all your policies and documents? <clears throat> and if you think back to just a few weeks ago, at the start of the new school year, you've got all your newbies, all those people that turn up fresh faced and keen and enthusiastic, and they need to read all the policies and documents, safeguarding, health and safety, loan working, for example. What you've probably got is an Excel spreadsheet, and there's nothing wrong with Excel spreadsheets. Normally very well color coded, nice red ones to show that things are due imminently. And you'll also have a system of emails where you'll email people and say, can you go onto the Z drive, search amongst all the policies that are in there and find the safeguarding policy and read it. Once you've read it, can you then go to the staff room and sign the book? That person will then go to the staff room to make sure that everyone has signed the book. If they haven't, they then start chasing up with emails. And there's got to be a better way of doing that. And again, IAM does that in an automated way, so you don't have to get involved at all. IAM will automatically remind people that they need to read policies. It will even remind you if you need to review a policy as well. What's good, it's it's a bit like that um, relation that turns up at Christmas that you didn't like. Every week you will get a reminder to read a policy or to review a policy. So it's, it's, it's pretty on it. I used to have to review 20, 20 odd policies all at the same time. Trust me, when you get in 24 emails once a week, you, you start reviewing policies. You give up the fight. So all that is contained. And that that basically is, is a management tool. You'll be able to put everything all in one place. You'll be able to distribute it amongst the staff or individuals. And you'll also be able to track who's read things and who hasn't, down to the amount of time they've actually read it. So somebody could have read a 28-page document in 30 seconds, for example. I'm kind of thinking that's probably where you want to get the fire extinguishers out because their pants are definitely on fire because that ain't true. Also, something else that we didn't we didn't bank on, to be honest, uh, Luke and I. But what people are doing is they're looking at the readership reports and they're actually identifying at what time people have read things. And we're seeing that some staff are reading things at one, two o'clock in the morning. And that's raising the potential well-being welfare issue as well. So you can see how things can expand. And this is all done from the comfort of your own chair. Then we move on to the dreaded risk assessments. Risk assessments are really simple. I think we've over, over exaggerated on risk assessments. So there is a need for them, clearly. 
because you've got a lot of children that you're looking after. So your risk assessments are probably a higher priority than if you're in just a normal working business, for example. But that said, again, it's the management of those. And if you manage those the same way as you do with your policies and your documents, keep them in a central storage area. Again, allocate them to people to read. Make sure that people have read them, have that signature report and get those reminders to make sure that your risk assessments are up to date. In IAM, you can use your own risk assessments, or we've got a template, electronic version, very basic, very simple. What's the hazard? And then what's the measures to mitigate those hazards? And that really is what a risk assessment's all about. Moving on to the training area. Now, training was always, um, I used to do a training session at the start of the year. I had health and safety. I'd, I had a 30 minute slot. Marketing got an hour and a half. For their slots i don't i don't quite know how all that worked out to be honest but i'd have my half hour slot i'd condense my health and safety training all into one bit all the staff would be there <clears throat> and that was my job done for the week but unfortunately not all the staff were there so during the week i was constantly doing updates on health and safety training for one or two people that had missed it and then the next day there'd be another two people would turn up it was an absolute nightmare and I calculated that I probably spent a day of that first week back just doing health and safety training. Absolute nightmare. The other problem you've got with training is you rely on everyone being in the same place at the same time. You rely on the presenter being available at the time that you want them to be available. So, again, you need to think ahead and book that well in advance. Otherwise, you'll miss out. And you need to have a venue for all, the, all those actions to happen in the same place. That takes time. Normally, a good presentation will be about two hours minimum. Most of that will be the fact that you're spending a lot of money on the presenter coming in and they will spend a lot of their time talking about their own experience and their own life cycle, how they got to where they are today without actually talking too much about the valid points. And that's to justify the two hours and the money that you've spent. It's normally done in a darkened hall. And if we're all going to be brutally honest, generally, they are extremely boring. So if you ever want, there used to be a place, I'm ex-military, there used to be a place in Sandhurst, a lecture hall, it was called a sleeping bag because everyone just fell asleep as soon as you walked into the hall. So we need to make training a lot more interesting. We need to shorten the amount of time that people spend on training because your, your mind or your brain doesn't have the retention level to sit there for two hours and take everything in. It just doesn't happen. So again, IAM has got training modules. We've got over 350 training modules. Everyone's got access to them. The average module lasts about 15 minutes. And we find that staff will engage a lot better with those short, sharp sessions rather than one big, long session. And of course, the other thing to think about is if you want to train fire wardens in the school, you're probably going to be restricted by the amount of money you've got in your budget. So a presenter will come in, They'll say, I can train 10, 10 people for £2,000. You'll say, that's all right, we'll, we'll cover that in the budget. And you've got 10 members of staff trained for £2,000. Three of them inv invariably are going to leave at Easter. So you've now got seven, and then you might need to train other people up as well. What you can do with IAM is every single member of staff through the modules can be trained as fire safety warden. And again, there's no extra cost for that. So training's a biggie. Accident report, and particularly nowadays, where we have to account for everything, we've got an accident report and form. It's called incident, so you can report accidents all the way down to observations and near misses. Really simple to use. All staff have got access to the report. And what it allows you to do is you can carry out any investigation regarding an accident, upload that information onto the report, and you can create management actions off that report as well. So if you can imagine it, you've had an accident in the school. This is what we've done about it. This is all the different action points, and they've now all been completed. So we've actually done something about that accident that's happened. I was quite lucky because my last job, it was in a private school. So we had a nurse. So me and Nursey used to sit down once a week, review all the accidents. And then we review them every half term as well. Because all those accidents collated together at the end of the half term paint a completely different picture than they do on the weekly report that we were looking at. So we could identify individual pupils. Little George was always a nightmare in the playground. He was always bumping into people, falling off trees or whatever. So again, we could warn people off the fact that when you're out and about, 
keep an eye on little George because he's going to fall out the tree if he's climbing it. So again, accident report, and it's more than just a report. You can analyze the data that's in there. Fault reporting is the biggie for me. It was the most stressful thing in the world. It's all time consuming. You do need the teaching staff to report faults. That's essential. You'll have the site teams and the caretakers making their own to-do list up, but you do need uh, staff reporting faults. And here's where we have the problem, because if a staff reports that the shelf is loose and about to fall down, in teaching world, that is the most important thing. Outside of that, when it hits the site team, half their day is going to be spent doing compliance checks. So that leaves the other half of the day to be able to prioritize all the firefighting work that's coming through. And if they can only manage to do eight things a day, as far as firefighting is concerned, and they're getting 10 requests, somebody's always going to be number nine and number 10 on that list. And that is where the problem comes, because people just think that they're getting left out. My main problem was communication. I think that's generally a problem throughout all schools. I had a 42 acre estate, so I certainly, when a report, when a fault was reported to me, I would go and investigate it, have a look at it, say, right, I'll do that tomorrow because I've got a similar job, so we can do both jobs at the same time. I didn't then spend the rest of my day walking around 42 acres trying to find Mrs. Smith to tell her I'm going to put a shelf up tomorrow. Unfortunately for me, the headmistress's office was en route to the dining room. So Mrs. Smith, et al., found it quite easy popping the head into the headmistress and saying, I've reported something Andy and he hasn't got back to me. And that's a massive problem. And the easy way of doing it is, what we've got on IAM, is you've got a little note section. So I could put in the note in there, say, I'm going to do this job tomorrow. And the teacher's automatically notified there and then that the job's been addressed. And you'll be surprised just how much that little note section makes a difference to the to the relationship, if, if you like, between the site team and the teachers. The most common way of reporting faults at the moment is, of course, the corridor. Get stopped in the corridor. And I'm going to tell you a little secret here. I don't know if this is going to surprise people. Site team members, particularly at this time of the year in the run up to Christmas, will have a favourite teacher and a not favourite teacher. If that surprises anyone, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. So if the favorite teacher approaches me, they go top the list. If the non-favorite teacher approaches me, they go bottom the list. What the fault reporting in IAM does is it allows it to be managed. You have a central manager who can properly prioritize jobs, see how long a job has been on the system for, because sometimes the job that's moving up the list will keep getting knocked down the list because other things come in. So it's important to make sure that it's all time related as well. But a really good feature, teaching staff uh, who use IAM absolutely love our help desk. They think it's brilliant. So in essence, we've got so many problems, things that you probably didn't expect that you'd be encountering. But oddly enough, there is one solution and that's IAM. And basically it covers everything, all the problems that we've just discussed there, IAM will cover that. And you'll be able to view all those problems and manage all those problems from the comfort of your desk, particularly as we're in winter season and you probably don't want to get out as much. And here ends, what is it you say? Here ends the lesson. Is that what you say? I do. Has anyone got any questions? Because Luke is on, on standby to answer. I think that's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for um, for going through that. So comprehensive, such a fantastic platform. Not only does it, um, you know, help with uh, the compliance factor, but it also helps with training, which is fabulous, and communication. And we do have a question, um, and it's from Robert, and it's with regards to the online training. My current provider recommends face-to-face -face training every so many years and online in between. How does IM compare to having this uh, use IM online training before with another trust? How can the auditor look at the information in an audit and can we just do online training and save costs? That's a very good question, Robert. Very good one. Good one for Luke there. Well, there's a few elements to that. There's a few elements to that. So, so essentially, I mean, kind of 
we don't enter, try to teach teachers, but um, but essentially the um, our training is broken down into um, into short bite sized training, uh, shorter training courses that collectively make a sort of a wider um, uh, a wider qualification. So for example, uh, we have just agreed with IOSH to build um, a so all all schools need to have a school sustainability um lead by 2025 so we are currently building a uh, a collection of 11 IOSH approved training courses that break down the component parts of what a sustainability lead will be but when they when they collectively do that together uh they get a separate qualification which is a school sustainability um lead as well so um so you you get each of the each of the elements you get a qualification and then collectively you get a wider qualification so, um, so in that regard, if you if you think that actually, when you go and take any kind of training, like Andy said, that there's there's the uh, there's the Ebbinghaus curve. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Ebbinghaus curve, where you basically you you don't retain the amount of information. If you sit in a classroom for three hours or four hours, you retain something like something like eight percent of the of the um, of the content within, or you lose ninety two percent within thirty days. So um, if you think, if you scale that back, certainly in workplace training, if you've got three key learning outcomes for each of those courses that you actually build, three key learning outcomes for each of them, that's the critical bit that you need to do. Now, if that's delivered in 15 minutes or delivered in two hours, that's entirely down to the person delivering, delivering the training. So if they're delivering the training in two hours, it's because they've got costs and overheads to, to do it with. I think what will happen is that a lot of people will tell you that sort of training that when somebody comes in and does face-to-face -face training, and I'm not saying I'm not advocating certain things that do need face-to-face -face training. Like I would not advocate advocate anything other than face-to-face -face training for first aid training, for example. You must do go and have somebody to come into your school and show you on a sort of a mannequin as well how the um, how that works with um, staying alive and whatever when you go and sort of pump the, pump the chest. But but something like asbestos awareness training. No, that's a, that's it's you you can do that online and nobody. I mean, we had an HSE inspector visit one of our schools that use our system, and they called our system and our training the gold standard of what schools should have, um, and that's and that's because it meant that everybody in the school they, the school had asbestos, so every single member of that teaching staff had done a twenty minute asbestos training uh, asbestos awareness course, so everybody had a qualification. Everybody knew what they could and couldn't do. They all knew about chrysotile, asbestos, et cetera. And they had records for all that. But they also had a system that basically audited all of the um, items that were deemed to be asbestos. And you could actually show the monthly, the monthly asbestos inspections, the annual, inspection, annual asbestos inspection, the annual review of the, of, of the records and all the training as well. So, so yeah, there are. There, if somebody tells you, obviously there's commercial businesses out there that will tell you that face-to-face -face is, is a requirement. but um, it's all about the learning outcomes and actually getting the point across. And the learning outcomes, if you can get three learning outcomes in, in, in one sitting in 15 to 20 minutes, and then you cluster that together in a collection, you've got a lot of learning outcomes for one qualification that is obviously going to stand you in good stead. If any, anybody came and obviously knocked on the door and said, uh, can you show me what you've done on that, please? I think that's great. I think that's a bit... Um, that's, that's, a, there, that's a great right? answer. And also, there are other ways you can mitigate that. Um, you know, you can have the training all together in a staff meeting, for example, and then you know that people are actually accessing the training properly. You can have a short quiz to fill in afterwards, you know, uh, that, that asks three questions about the training which staff have to fill in. You know, there's there's ways that you can get around that but I think in this day and age I think online training is a very good way to move forward with things especially not just for ease of access but also to save costs um well, we've, we've got a we've, we've got an instructional learning designer so our learning the learning side of our business is a big part of our business we sell it to corporates so um so we sell in excess of a million minutes a month outside of the UK through resellers all around the world and that, and, and our, our sort of L and D side of our business, it sells, like it sells into corporates, but sells into schools as well. And um, it, it, it's all about the engagement. It's all about the engagement. And and there are very, very sort of creative ways to uh, to to enhance the engagement in online training. So, like you just said, quizzes. I mean, we've got a game. We've got a, we've got a course called Coping in Isolation. And part of the course that you you need to complete a game of Pac Man. 
um, it's, it's just part of the course. And so um, so there are different levels of engagement that you can get and different quiz banks that you can get. It's not just the sort of standard click here and drag and drop. There are really sort of sophisticated ways of doing it. And we've got, like I said, learning professionals in the business that are in-house um, learning. Are, are actually, our head of learn, our head of um, instructor, our head instructor designer actually lives in New York City. She's American and uh, she lives in New York City, but she's um, but she is absolutely on the top of her game, and that's why she's the best person for that role. And and um, and it's really really well well crafted and put together. And it's like I said, I go back to what I was saying before. It's all about the learning outcomes. That's fantastic. Training is massive in compliance. Training is massive in compliance. It's mm. it's uh, and that's why we take it so seriously. And that's why I'm sort of I, I'm quite an, a, a big advocate of it. Definitely, and I can and it comes through. It's really fabulous. Thank you so much. And I, I've got a question, if that's all right. Um, to, to to one of you or both of you, it doesn't really matter. But what do you find is the biggest issue for schools at the moment in terms of compliance? What are their biggest worries? Time. Mm. Time. Yeah. Ultimately, it's time. It's it, uh, and every school I've worked in, I've I've saved them money because I've done the, the annual emergency light test and I've done all mm. the pat testing myself because you don't have to send that out to contractors. So I can save money. That's the easy bit. But that has taken my time. And time is that there's only so many minutes, uh, so many hours in uh, in a working day. I, I will say, though, on, on coming back on that, I mean, I did sit in my office desk once and I just had to do lists from hell just everywhere. And I just thought I'm spending all my time producing these to do lists rather than doing things. And I just thought, just knuckle down and get on with it. And for example, when people say I don't have time to do the monthly fire alarm check, uh, the, the monthly fire extinguisher check. Well, you do, because to inspect a fire extinguisher on a monthly basis takes 30 seconds. You might have 100 of them, so that means it's it's now down to 50 minutes. So that's an hour in, in the month that you've got to set aside. So you do have time. In a, in a seven-hour day, you have got that hour to check all your fire extinguishers. The problem is, of course, you've got other things going on as well. So the solution to time is time management and prioritizing things correctly. But definitely time is the biggest. And that's the one we hear all the time, isn't it, Luke? All the time. It is purely because there's so many other things getting getting lumped onto schools as well, isn't there? I mean, like the like the big the big topic in the summer was rack. The big topic, the big topic will be next summer will be sustainability even more. They'll be turning the screw on that. You've got the sustainability policy paper that's going to enhance. The need for somebody to obviously take the lead in there as well and they're sort of going to affect their time because generally when you speak to school business managers they're also the head of hr they're the head of finance we've got some school business managers that go and drop food off around to kids houses with are on free school meal it's just that there is just literally no time in the day and it's um it's 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 astounding really but um yeah that's the that, that's the that's the nature of the beast that obviously we're trying to tackle and we're trying to obviously build a system enough that enables schools to be able to offset a lot of that and and have a system that can systematically manage some of the, the stuff that can obviously take some of that pain away so, and, wow. and what i to say to people is that if 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 you find that you haven't got time if you do nothing at all this time next year you you would have done nothing if mm. you can do one thing a week then this time next year you're 52 steps ahead of the game and ultimately and unless i'm not reading the bbc website correctly the HSE will not sue you because you haven't put up Mrs. Smith's shelf in a classroom, but they will sue you if you're not maintaining your asbestos log. So that's it's a case of the priority and a case of obviously balancing it out. And recording it as well. Recording it, yeah. I've got, yeah. Recording it and evidence in your duty of care. But yeah. but so, w w one thing we haven't done on this call actually is give you the, the obviously the live version of the of the system because obviously we've um we've not quite got there but obviously if you did want to sign up and, and obviously you can see a live version if you go onto our free version you, there's there's five videos you can watch that actually give you a good overview about what we do as well so we that that's brilliant and we've got some really positive comments comments coming through and you know and I I completely agree with with them and you know it's a very comprehensive system I would certainly use it if I was in school um uh Neil says that they're using I am comp compliant across the mat the on-site premises teams and school business managers find it very easy to use and they include our contractors for scheduling PPM activities I also monitor daily the compliance scoring percentage to avoid slippage at the sites so really positive um 
comments coming through from our listeners today. So thank you so much for. It's brilliant. Thank you very much, Neil. Well. Yeah, pretty appreciate yeah, that. Uh, yeah, Neil and Robert, which is great. Um, Robert says, "Is it best to maybe try and schedule training over the course of a year in quarters rather than all at the start of the year? And what needs to be done every year? And has anyone done this in any other trust?" What what I what I used to do, and and people seem to like it. I I used to have a, a period, whether it's a half term or a month or whatever. So let's say January is fire awareness month. That's when the site team got on top of all the fire checks, so all the fire servicing, everything like that was done. All the staff done all their fire training, so fire awareness, fire warden safety training. I used to, uh, the headmistress was absolutely brilliant because she supported everything because she understood the compliance aspect. I would give a presentation. I worked at a private girls' school. I would give a presentation to the girls in assembly and say, this is why you don't have fire doors wedged open. This is why we don't leave bags in the corridor. And what that gave us for that whole month of January, Fire Awareness Month, everyone was in the same mindset. Everyone thought about fire awareness. The topic was fire awareness. I never had one fire extinguisher prop in a door open for the whole of January. The next month we moved on to Legionella or the next half term or however you want to do it, asbestos. But I find if you pick a theme and, and associate the training with that particular theme, it all makes sense then. It all kind of, it, it, it's all in the same pot rather than just doing ad hoc training here, there and everywhere that doesn't really link in together. So that, that's how I used to do it. I think the uh, just to just to highlight, I don't know if we've got time to just just go on that one as well. So, um, so like I said, we do we do we do um, our, our training is also sold into the learning space of the corporate learning space, and so the trends that they've got in the in the L and D world at this moment in time is all about um, is all about having um, focus months, and, fo and I suppose you could do that in focus terms. So. There are learning management systems out there at the moment, um, like sophisticated learning management systems that we're, and we're trying to sort of bring this into our learning management system, where you can basically tailor a theme for a period of time. So what we want schools to do is to be able to tailor a theme, like I said, for a term, just as Andy said there as well. So if you want to do all your fire in one in one particular term, do it. And, and what that means is that it is that you can break it up into different areas uh, over this over the whole year, because you are never going to get anybody to sit there. I mean, school teachers have got directed hours. So you are never going to get them to sit down and and actually take in all this stuff. Um, I mean, really, the, the statutory training you need to give them is probably on our systems, probably around about two hours. So uh, and everybody's trying to get everything done in about a space of about an hour. So they can obviously limit the amount of time that the teachers has in front of a classroom. But make it fun and engaging, make it part of a theme and just drop it in every so often and just try and get that. You can assign courses in our, in our training library. Like I said, we, we are adding more sophistication in there that you can actually have themed themed um, periods of time to the, to the LMS as well. So, um, yeah, we are trying to sort of move with the curve as well, but but there is obviously science around there somewhere that if you can actually break down windows of time in your year, you are going to get a better kind of response rate and more importantly, a better engagement level as well. Well, brilliant. Thank you. And we've got one other question from Steve who says, would you be looking at holding some best practice workshops so that you can focus on some areas of the school business that we uh, so that we can watch and actually see what the system can be used for. So like Andy suggested with SEAM training. Yeah, so so one of the things that we're actually, um, one of the things we're actually doing, uh, which has been a recommendation for a, a quite a large number of our schools that use our system, is um, is to actually build, start building a, a, a community group. And that includes things like, like I said, just sort of covering various topics, not just related to I'm compliant, because I think we've got a lot of information between myself, Andy Ball, and other people in our organisation, and also other school members. Of, I mean, we've got a, there's a compliance officer that works for a large map that uses our system. We've got 54 secondary schools, and she is absolutely brilliant. And she really wants to sort of help other schools as well, because she realises that not every school's got in the lucky position. They can afford to obviously take on a compliance manager. So um, so she wants to get involved. I don't, I don't know if you know... Um, Joe, uh, Joe Merchant as well. She's launched this book called the, the School Premises Handbook. So Joe wants to get involved in this community group as well. So we've got different things that we can um, that we can sort of share amongst ourselves. So sort of watch this space for this one because the marketing our marketing team's in the process of putting all that together. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, and really, really, really helpful uh, information today. Uh, we've also got a link for you here to download the free compliance toolkit. 
Um, I, we've popped it into the chat. Uh, so if you want to have a look at that, please feel free to do so. It's been really lovely to chat to you two today. And I hope our guests and our listeners have found it useful and helpful. Um, if you have any questions, you can either contact us at Teacher Chat via social media or send us an email, info at headteacherchat.com. Or you can visit the I Am Compliance website. Is there an email address that they can contact you on? Uh, yeah, contact, well, it's quite easy. I'm Luke at IamCompliant.com and Andy is Andy at IamCompliant.com. We were the first people Brilliant. to get our, web, our email addresses when we set it up. So fortunately, there's uh, other people in there now. I've got like Laura 1 and Laura 2 and Tom 1 and Tom 2, but we're, <laughs> we're, def we're just Luke and Andy. We like simple ones. That's a really good idea. So thank you ever so much for joining us today. We hope you've gained valuable experience uh, and insights into I am compliance and how it can make it easier to maintain compliance. Um, we appreciate your time and special thanks to our guests. And we look forward to seeing you in our future uh, I, um, Empower Ed events. Thanks ever so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone.